Hello and welcome to the final day of Interact Global, uh, the free virtual edition of Momentus Interact Conference. Um, first of all, I'd like to say a huge thanks to Emily Trotter, Lisa Reeves, Liz Hubert and Diana Sonis for their brilliant talks yesterday um, and every speaker and panellist that's joined us over the course of this week. Um, Coming this afternoon, we have a design leadership panel discussing uh, what makes a great leader and the future of design leadership at 1pm UK time. Um, and we'll be joined then by Felicia Williams, design director at Twitter, Yander Sheffer, chief marketing and sales officer at Swissquote, and Sophie Dennis, director of human centred design and customer experience at the Department of Health and Social Care. <laughs> Coming up later at 3 p.m. UK time for our final session, we also have Melanie Yenkin, uh, UX design lead at Google, with her talk, How to Build uh, Inclusive UX Team Culture. There is still time to sign up for those, so if you haven't done so already, you can do that over on our Eventbrite page. Um, but before that and up now, uh, we welcome back an Interact favourite, Angel Brown, uh, Group Director of Experience Strategy at Digitas Health, with her talk, Strategic Design Methods for Business Impact. So in our role as design strategists, we inspire the creation of exceptional products and solutions by leading with passion and purpose. This takes authority, gravitas, and the ability to communicate clearly and with the strategic use of drama, as well as KPIs. So in this talk, Angel's gonna look at the key tools to help us demonstrate these aspects, uh, such as a powerful strategic narrative and useful examples of strategic frameworks to apply to increase the impact and perceived value of our recommendations. Um, as always, say hello and join in the discussion using the chat. Um, make sure the chat settings are switched to panellists and attendees, and that way everyone can see your messages. Um, also, do let us know if there's any audio or stream issues there too, and we'll try and get that sorted ASAP. Um, and also, please ask lots of questions for Angel using the Q&A function, um, and I'll run through these uh, at the end. Um, Finally, we are using auto-generated captions. Um, some of these get a little muddled live sometimes, so just bear with us. And when we upload this to our YouTube channel, we will make sure um, that they are all accurate and up to date. Um, cool, so without further ado, um, over to you, Angel. Hello, everyone. Uh, as Henry said, I'm Angel Brown. I'm the Group Director for Experience Strategy at Digitas Health in London. It's a bit of a gray day today, but you know the mood here in, in the UK is really positive. I was out yesterday with um, colleagues for like a, a, teen a team lunch. And it just felt like we're really, really getting back to normal. It's funny on the on the tube, some people are wearing masks, but it, it's really falling away now. I know we've got quite a few cases still, but um, I think the hospital rates and the, the deaths are so low that it's, it's really, really nearly back to business as usual, which is quite exciting. I'm going to start by talking just a little bit about my background and, and how I got to my role in, um, in strategy. I started as a designer back in my 20s in you know, print design. It, we were at that stage then. And then the internet happened. And my boyfriend at the time was a um, physics student. And he was talking about this new thing on the, you know, the internet. And I thought, I've got to get in on that. And so I went back to you need to do a master's largely to get in on the internet. And I joined a startup then. And I realized quite soon after that my superpower wasn't really design per se. It was actually talking to design companies about how to design for the internet and these new interactive systems. HCI of course existed, but it wasn't something that I had my eye on really. I feel like I invented our discipline in a way because I was starting to sketch out wireframes to help the designers. And then from there, I moved into research and UX and I became head of UX for a number of agencies. And then I think about eight years ago, Ogilvy um, reached me, out to me and said, you know, we're very interested in you. We like the way you think. You think very much like a planner, but we have a role for head of strategy, not for a, a very, very senior UX role. And I said, well, I don't know, that might be interesting. And so we talked further and I thought actually this probably would be a good fit for me. I insisted on adding comma UX to my, to my title then, but that was the last time I did that. I have moved now into pure play strategy. But what I found very useful is to bring design thinking principles and methods into my work across all types of strategy. So I look after things like brand strategy, product strategy, omni-channel strategy, digital transformation, media strategy, and we do an awful lot with analytics. So my, my work in my last role 
I worked on the analytics team for, for a couple of years, really learning about data science. You know, my passion was really about how do I take the insights that I get from qual research, but tie them into data points that suddenly then can connect the dots between the systems that we're designing for and the reporting and the engagement data that I'm seeing as an output of my, of my qual research and my personas, et cetera. And so that gave me deep um, kind of insights into how to do that. I work in health. So things like smoking cessation um, tools. We worked on something, got a award for it last year, which I loved, which is a 3D heart. We worked with a CGI company. Very interesting to show a cardiologist a, a 3D heart in a way that they've never seen before. They're used to these very black and white fuzzy images and then to see how they could play around with it was really exciting. We do patient support things, digital therapeutics, and then a whole bunch of marketing. Now, I'm, um, I, what this talk is about, why, why did I put this talk together? It's, it's really about how to maximize the power of our skill set by championing design methods in a way that will make business people hear you and believe you, and most importantly, get excited about what you have to say. And why is that emotional aspect important? I you know, put in the blurb for my talk about this idea of drama. It's very important to connect with people at an at a emotional level to get them to mobilize themselves and their teams around your vision. Now we know that IT projects are still failing. Most of them, you know, 70%, I think was the, the last stat that I looked at. And the reason why I see this day in, day out is that, you know, you put the, the kit in, you put, you know, the infrastructure in, but you don't spend, spend adequate time getting people trained up to adopt it. And it's not just about training. It's very much about getting them to believe that this is a tool that's going to help them do what they want to do. And, and that's why our methods around involving people in the journey and get it setting a sense of vision are really, really important. Now let's talk about the C-suite, talk about these business leaders that we're gonna to have to try and convince and mobilize around our vision. You know, this is a kind of a typical vision for me. It's not as diverse as you would hope still, unfortunately, but these people are, are, are very quick thinkers. They, are, they believe they're players. Usually what happens as you go around the table, they, they floated this company and, and that company they were responsible for you know, launching huge amounts of money or <laughs> companies and selling and buying and all that. And they want to work with people who also are, are, are on that kind of stage, not necessarily business people, but people that are going to give them that reassurance that they have something special to offer, but will give them the reassurance that it's going to work and it's going to take them forward. Now, the problem though, that I find is that the board brain doesn't see the complexity we do. So on the design thinking side, we've got, we use something called abductive thinking. I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit more depth, but you know, we frame our problems there and we come up with solutions and it's complex. There may not be one more, there could be more than one solution, but on the board side, it's really very simple. There are, are three jobs to do, there are three, issues, problems to solve whatsoever, but there's one solution. And it's a simple story. It's a story that can be told on the back of a fag packet, packet if you will. Seems like a bit of an outdated <laughs> way to describe that on a napkin, you know. But the key thing is the abductive thinking for us. And that's something that we can bring to the table that can help us not only and take the insights that come from a number of sources, but to tell a story around it, to make hypotheses. I'm just going to dig into the different types of reasoning now so you can see a little bit more clearly what I have in mind. So the deductive reasoning is making an inference based on widely accepted facts or premises. So here's an example. If a beverage is defined as drinkable through a straw, you could use deduction to determine that soup is a beverage. You know, pretty straightforward there. Inductive reasoning or induction is making an inference based on an observation, often of a sample. So you can induce that the soup is tasty if you observe all your friends are consuming it. 
Now, abductive reasoning or abduction is making a probable conclusion from what you know. So if you see an abandoned bowl of hot soup on the table, you can use abduction to conclude that the owner of a soup is likely to return soon. Now, this is the type of reasoning that a doctor uses to make a diagnosis from a set of disparate results. This is also the type of reasoning that a detective uses. So if you go to a crime scene and you see fragments of, of information and then you tell a story in your head. Now, we as UX people are super gifted in this type of reasoning. And I believe that that is one of the things that we really bring to the table. We are able to then help the business form hypotheses, which you'll see a bit later, that then we can test. And we're in the digital age now with data. And so it's all about testing. So let's start from first principles. What are we talking about? On, in our side, we've got user, we've got human-centered design, we've got co-design, we've got words like you know, design thinking. And then on their side, they talk about innovation. And so there's a parallel there between what we conceive of as, as design thinking and what they see of as innovation and digital transformation as well. That is in the same kind of space. And so what I'm asking us to do is to, instead of using our own jargon, you know, buzzwords, to try and put our buzzwords in their terms and then to find a level playing field and to start a conversation. Fortunately for us, design thinking happens on both sides. So they've already got a nuance of that. They've been looking at the, the management reports, things like McKinsey, et cetera, talk about this interesting thing, design thinking. But what they're thinking there is this is gonna give me an edge on the competition because it's gonna help me innovate. So another thing that's kind of linked to the idea of drama and emotion is about how do you play this? And like, how do you show up as a person? Like, what is your persona? And on the left there, I find um, one of my colleagues is really great at this. It's like the mystic church of UX in a way. He is able to use the buzzwords in a way that makes him sound like a priest, you know, like a member of an elite um, kind of <laughs> space with secret knowledge, you know, but very valuable knowledge. And, and I think you can be very effective playing that role. Now on the other side, this is more where I find myself, I, I sort of size up this C-suite person, you know, and I try and figure out, okay, so they, what buzzwords and, or what domains, I'm using the word buzzword, it sounds a bit negative, but what spaces of design thinking can I leverage here that this person will be able to hook into? And that trying to, to start that conversation that I've been talking about, you have to use enough to, to be able to make them believe that you have something that's gonna show them a, a new way or a different way to, to, it's often about growth, it's about getting an edge over the competition. So the point I'm making here is it's not just about the stuff that you've got on your slides or your knowledge, it's about how do you play it and how do you show up to the business. So let's talk about just about our domain. So we've got, um, you know, our the, user-centered design process, inspiration, ideation, iteration, the double diamond, you know, and we've got a lot of tools that map into this. We've got design research, we've got synthesis, ideating and prototyping, feedback, piloting, and evaluation. Now, a key thing that isn't on here that is very important for the business is the idea of visioning. And I've mentioned that already. But what is important is to get the team together, the C-suite there. You don't always get the C-suite in the once you get into the project, but to setting to set that vision that they will then see in a very succinct way is, is important. Now, some of the tools that I use on this that I found very um, useful are in workshops, ways to engage people to get their ideas with post notes, et cetera, to the table to then create that sort of sense of why are we here? And we use things like problem framing, framing and ideation. But if you put pivot that into an idea, okay, okay, what's our vision here? People at the table, project team, what's our mission? These are words that then connect into the way they see the world and make it easier then to align. So on the left there, I've got an example of, of one that I use all the time. It's funny because you can see there, it's, really, it's a print metaphor. It's like um, a, a next year's headlines in a print story. 
like a newspaper. But I often pivot that into, you know, if there's a specific internal news place or um, a website, etc., like The Guardian. I also use um, many other similar methods from the IDEO cards there. But the, this one in particular gets them to really dream about what, where, do we, where are we going to go with this? And then the quote is important too. So for example, in, in my world, they might say, oh, it's a patient story. I want to cure cancer sort of thing. And, and from through the patient's eyes, or it could be in a medical journal having a breakthrough. And so you really get a sense for each member of the, the stakeholder team, what, where, they, where their ambitions lie. And this then allows you to craft a project mission that then gets that emotional buy-in and gets them mobilized. Now on the right here, I, one of the things we've used recently, you know, for our personas, we often use axes. Now the bottom right there, this kind, kind of technique on a mural board or mirror board is very useful because people put their initials in and then they might um, take a, a question, you know, how important do you think this is? It could be um, engaging with the patients and then they can move the dots along. It's just a little technique, but anything that allows people to work together and to see the similarities there, um, I find very effective in that initial visioning se se session. Okay, now let's talk about design research. There's often a tension for me with design research, and I'm sure many of you will find the same in your work, where the, in principle, the business is interested. However, the amount of time that it might take and the wherewithal is, is, creates a concern because they always need to move at the speed of light, of course. But where you can get in to really leverage that, that idea and get them to see the value of it is if you can express it in terms of uncovering a market need. Again, it's like this idea of something hidden that if we find it for you, then you will be able to have growth and a competitive edge. Another term we use is an unmet need. So again, that speaks to this idea of something that if you could just frame a solution around it, you could then create an edge or a growth. Opportunity is another word. So if we use words like co-design, affinity, diagramming, etc., you know, empathy maps, that's all quite technical. And perhaps one level down, that will be very valuable and meaningful. But at the business level, it, it just doesn't translate. It's too much d detail. But if we can frame it in terms of market need, then they'll be all over you. And they'll be like, yes, yes, let's do the research, I find. Now here's a, a lovely diagram. This is from David Vogel, used to be um, head of experience strategy at AKQA. And for me, this, this type, type of way of describing research, it just feels great, you know, because it's, it's got detail, it's got surface and deep, it's got what people say, do, and know, feel, and dream. He was he's digging into that kind of unpromptable, kind of emotional, kind of aspirational, um, aspects of um, an identity. Uh, the techniques, interviews, observations, and he uses generative sessions to tap into that, that kind of layer of the subconscious that um, other research methods can't get to. And then on the knowledge, explicit, observable, tacit, and latent in the same way. But this kind of thing is, is really not useful to the C-suite because again, the, the model is too complicated. They can't see a way in, there's no way in for them. But what I have found very, very useful is the idea of behavioral insights. So on the left, we have declarative, and this is where we have our call research, our, our user-centered research, et cetera. Secondary research, you know, we use GWI to understand behaviors at scale of segments. That's very useful for understanding and designing things. But then the behavioral insights is where the C-suite starts to prick up their ears and, and think, well, this is very valuable. And so if you can position your research as something that will then allow them to understand be behavioral insights, that's something that I find is very powerful. New methods grab attention. This is something we've been working on just recently. I love this platform. It's called Indemo. And it's a diary study or enables diary studies. We're doing something with younger patients here. And so the, the notion that is really um, caught the C-suite's attention is that it's using the tools that the digital natives, digital natives 
use themselves. And so you can capture video from in a typical diary study way. But one of the most interesting things for me is that you can also add comments and you can drill in at, into in a kind of an interview style, but with comments as if you were on social media in a way that in this case, a young person would be doing every day. So these kind of things as well that give a kind of a new twist on things. I think in the old days, you guys will probably remember things like heat, you know, eye tracking and heat maps and all that kind of thing that always get, gains the attention and people think, oh, this is really, you've got the secret knowledge, you've got the technology, especially it really grabs the attention of the C-suite. Here we are with the, a video and, you know, the wonders of technology now, it, it transcribes as you go and um, it codes them. Yeah, it's a really wonderful platform and it, it kind of speaks to me to where we are all going with research. Okay, so now we've done our research, we've done our divergent thinking and now we need to pull it all together. So our words, you know, we talk about the intersection of desirability, feasibility and viability, you know, to an extent, again, thinking about IDEO, that does not work. It doesn't, it falls a bit flat with the C-suite because it's kind of obvious to them. They're always looking for that secret angle or that corner that are, you know, the inside, if you will, that's going to give them the strategy, you know. The product canvas, that's great, you know, on our side, we, we find that, that any sort of canvas very useful. But again, you're going to see, I've got an example a bit later, that it's a lot of detail, you know, it's great for us and our methods. But when you're presenting to the C-suite, it's, it's, it's got just inherently a lot of data there. And the strategic imperatives, they boil things down to very simple set, usually three, of strategic things that have to be done, and they're presented very clearly. Whereas we have a service blueprint that is, a, is an action planner in itself, but it's a very detailed one. It tells the complete story. And I've spent many years of my life enjoying making these documents, but, and, and they're beautiful because of the, the attention spent to them. But when you're trying to present them, if you walk through, then I think that works. But <laughs> it takes a lot of time, you know, and so it needs to be boiled down. Now, I just wanted to pause a little bit on, on personas because I found these very, very controversial throughout my career and I'm sure many of you have as well. Some people really get them and they believe in their use, of course. Other people, however, feel that they are quite old fashioned and the, the, uh, their concept of a persona is something that, you know, you're doing qualitative research, people are just saying stuff, it's not, derived from behavioral insights and it's always a small number so what's the sample for this and you know they're asking about sample size for qualitative research which means the fundamental lack of understanding about the value of qual research you know and that what they don't realize as well is they have a unique role to play and even with my colleagues who are very sophisticated at developing you know omnichannel engagement they still don't see the value of having an initial position on what these people care about, what's important to them to design from. You know, those that do understand that this is valuable will then put them into the space of, oh, it's a design persona. And so what is, okay, so what does that mean? That means not something that you can use. Sometimes the media colleagues will say this, this is not the way we would target people anyway. And, and they don't see the value then of, well, I guess they do in a sense because they think it's a design thing. It's like something that you might do up front and then you throw it in a drawer. I found, however, if I can reframe it a bit and if I get this kind of pushback, I can use terms like archetype or profile. And those terms allow me to get past the, the kind of baggage that the word persona has in, you know, if I'm speaking to people who feel that they're a bit old fashioned and we still then get the end result that we want, which is to do the research, to be able to then um, frame the design challenges and design something that's going to be valuable. So what we are increasingly trying to do is to stop them just being something that's used up front and put in a drawer to then building in these behavioral cues that, and data points that I was talking about. So let's take a look at the way a, maybe a business would see the quantitative insights that would be a, essential for a segment profile. 
So this would be a cluster of people who prescribes a low percentage of the latest intraocular lenses using the space of cataracts. You know, if you have cataracts, you get an intraocular lens put in, which will then allow you to see. So there's a, a bunch of ophthalmologists out there who they really don't believe in the latest intraocular lenses. They just put them on, you know, the standard ones, they're good enough. Those, those new ones are cause additional problems. I don't, I don't feel comfortable with it. They only use them for cases where the patient has failed on the standard. So if they've had one lens and it really hasn't worked for them, then they'll be like, okay, we'll try the higher percentage. So you can see that there's a data point there for the low, lowest percentage of latest intraocular lenses. Say they use 20% of their practice, only use them for cases where the patient has failed on the standard. So that would be used in second line, the way we describe it in healthcare. Doesn't use a digital scanner to scan the eye. So what this company has realized that Interestingly, an in, a leading indicator of a higher prescription of latest intraocular lenses is getting a digital scanner. So th then the, the question becomes strategically, do we then try and shift that behavior? Do we go in not just hard on selling the, the lenses, but do we try and get them interested in the digital scanner first? What is that journey to purchase? engages on digital comms occasionally. So this cluster of people, you know, sometimes they, they are looking at some of our stuff, you know, okay, attending educational days sporadically. So in this world, when you're talking to doctors, education is a really valuable way in, but this person only, um, this cluster of people only attends sporadically. Now the qual research then will allow us to give color to those data points. So we've got a set, a collection of data points that's our job to try and change those. So what we know from the qual is that this cluster actually has trouble getting patients to go for the most expensive option. The, the reason that they're not doing it is not because they don't really believe in it, it's just that the patients won't do it. Doesn't see the value behind, beyond the standard. Okay, but it's good enough, you know, why should I really persuade the patients to, to find more money essentially if I, I just don't see that it adds an additional quality of life um, boost, you know, the digital scanner doesn't work with the rest of the workflow. So, okay, I, I'm not anti the scanner, but it just doesn't fit, you know, works with the competitor normally, but sometimes sees something interesting from the company across digital and events. So the reason for the low engagement is that this person isn't not engaging, it's just not engaging with us. And so that then helps us when we're trying to attack these, these points, that, the data points that we need to shift, that we know are important on that journey, we have the backup, we know why. And so if you can present this story to the, the, the C-suite, the business, then they can see why we have to do both types of um, analysis. We have to include both types of insights in our personas and the personas need to be living documents. Okay, now I'm going to talk about something that we as UX people don't get hugely involved in because this is kind of facing into more of a brand planner kind of space with strategic narratives. Now, they the, and have been very impressed by brand planners I've worked with in the way they are able to tell a persuasive and powerful story with emotion and just to grab the hearts and minds of the audiences. And using tools that are part of storytelling itself, you will see if you, you go and um, take creative writing courses, that this is how they do that. You know, they have a compelling plot, they've got characters, they've got a climax, you know, and a conclusion. And I'm gonna walk you through two examples I've put together. Now, the first one is a better EpiPen. So EpiPens are for people who have allergic reactions, they can go into anaphylactic shock, you know, people who are allergic to nuts or bees or that kind of thing, and they have to carry around a pen that if that may start happening, they inject themselves and then that will mitigate the risk. The other story I'm gonna tell you about is hybrid services. So this would be a client that's coming to us saying that they want to reach out to their doctors in a way that is not just face-to-face because -face, they use reps, but we also want to use digital channels and have a mix and orchestrate it in a way that makes sense and is user-centric. So the hero's journey is a key tool in storytelling 
and this is ancient actually, this is from 1949, Joseph Campbell. And if you haven't ever dug into this, I really advise it because I find it's, it's fascinating. And you probably have heard that things like the Star Wars narrative, you know, any narrative for any film practically is based on the hero's journey. It's a story of someone who gets a call to adventure there's a there's specific characters, a threshold, a guardian, then a mentor, and but then there's a, a, a challenge, and the, you know they refuse the call, and abyss, dirt, dirt, death and rebirth, there's transformation, you know, atonement in return. I mean, it's all very grand language, but actually, if you boil it down and try and think about the plot and the story there, in terms of your story, it is still highly valuable. So let's walk through the, the example of the EpiPen. So what is the problem? So the EpiPen has been around for decades, but it's terrible. The product is huge to carry around. It goes out of date every year. And the design is so bad that many users inject their thumbs rather than their thighs. And it's recently become very expensive. And who does it affect? And how many of them are there? 10 million people globally are prescribed EpiPens. So why should we care? What, what, you know, what's the empathy or the drama there? They're so expensive and bulky that deaths occur, many of them in children. There are also a lot of defects. What can we do to change it? Our new product X, with its slim and intuitive design and longer shelf life, meets the needs for an affordable but portable and easy to use product. Two other products are also in the works, but ours will be better to meet the needs. And how can it lead to growth? Our estimates show that if we can be first to market and corner just 25% of the market in the UK for an early launch, we can disrupt a stagnant category and take a significant share. So you can see here, it's a very simple story, but it, and, and it is kind of in raw form. You know, if you put this in a deck, you'd, you'd kind of build it up there and, and images, etc. cetera. But it's, it tells all of the things that that business is looking for with a, a bit of drama there and you know the end it lands lands on growth which is important for, for the business so what you know what does it mean for us another tool that we um that we use all the time is the positioning statement again you know this is something that really crystallizes the the, the con and creates consensus for a group of people working on a project so our better epi pen is what it what is it it's for all patients who are at risk from an unplugged reaction due to allergies. What is it? It's an auto injectable device that delivers the drug epinephrine to provide a life saving, -saving me medication when experiencing a severe allergic reaction on flaxus and give patients peace of mind wherever they are because the slim design and storage benefits are easy to carry around so that patients have a lower risk of hospitalization and death. So when you're thinking, you know, going through all your beautiful deliverables and all that and thinking about what am I actually going to say, you know, <laughs> these kind of tools can help you be really succinct and really sharp on, on the story that you have. Okay, now let's take a look at the hybrid services, the strategic narr narrative for the um, wanting to serve the doctors by reps, but also via um, digital channels. So what's the problem? The world is changing with many doctors and patients now using online systems, but we as a business don't have the capability to serve them and we're falling behind our competitors. Who does it affect and how many of them are there? These limitations affect all our customers, the doctors and the patients who they serve. So if you can always link it to the patients, then that does increase the, the empathy there. Why should we care? Go for empathy and create drama. We are delivering fragmented communications that annoy our doctors and waste money. And what can we do to change it? If we can improve our tools and orchestrate our communications, we can provide valuable content to our doctors. And how can it lead to growth? Better communication will lead to improved patient outcomes and ultimately increased sales. You know, so I think you can see here how it, it seems quite a simple end point to get to. But there's a lot of data that goes behind this and it takes a long time to come up with a very succinct story that just it, everyone goes, yeah, that, that's what we have to do, you know. And I think diagrams can help. One of the things that we use a lot is about, it's the idea of a journey. The, the business is on a journey. Now, this one is visualizing a digital transformation journey as a roadmap. 
and there's kind of kind of a lot on this slide, but I still use it because I, I'm, I find that the multiple swim lanes almost, if you will, help me tell a more complicated, a more complicated story in a very easy to digest way. So the journey that the business is on, this is about personalization. So the journey and, you know, the businesses are always when you're showing this, you know, somewhere between one and two, your current state is there, you've got a long way to go. So from personalization, you start with manual personalization, you go to explicit personalization, you then when you're getting good, you go for behavioral. And then of course, the nirvana here on the, the right side is integrated and then AI driven, you know, building in the promise of AI is always very important because of the notion of reduced costs in terms of manual labor, et cetera, efficiencies and um, operations at scale. Okay, so then here also what we've got is a, is a swim lane that really talks about the strategy and the content effort showing, telling the story that as you get towards behavioral, actually internally, the processes, the amount of content you need, et cetera, goes up. But then as you, as you move along into enabling, or using it technology as an enabler, it starts to go down. And so these kind of journey kind of frameworks are, are very, very useful for the business because it tell, it's, tells a story on where you're gonna take them. And so if they do everything that you say, all of your wonderful um, plans and you know, d deliverables, whatever you have, then that will, that it will be the promise of where they might get to. It doesn't always have to be Nirvana, but it can be <laughs> the next step often. <laughs> Okay, we've talked a little bit about the, the complex deliverables and, uh, you know, we, we've all made these and we all can do make these day in, day out. But remember that the business is really looking at PowerPoint, our favorite tool, I'm sure everyone would agree. Um, and it's very much about very simple three things, you know, break things down into three. It's always three in strategy, you know, you can have four, but three is better. You know, and so, so how do you distill that down to three things? It's not easy, but the strategic narrative and these types of tools can help you do that. And being more conceptual about journeys. This is something that um, I find very helpful. You know, we, we have our journeys that are usually columns, you know, that go across a, a, a space on a page. But this way of describing it shows the interactions between the stages are where the important things are, in a sense, because that's the shift that you're trying to make. The, the, the things that you're doing are going to try and take people from awareness here to consideration. And in this case, it shows that there's quite a lot going on and that there are data points that we can measure our progress. And so this is a more conceptual way of talking about the job to be done across a, an entire journey. And I think, you know, that this has some flaws, but this is helpful to the business. It, it gives them a sense of, ah, okay, I see. So we've got them there and then we move them here and we're gonna take a look at stuff along the way. And so being conceptual rather than detailed is very useful. Okay, so let's talk about prototyping. Sorry about that. <laughs> so perils of working at home. So translation between three languages. On the left side, we've got iterative design and prototyping. These are our words, but then in their words, it's about organizational agility. And the word agile, you know, we use it in a purist sense, but the C-suite uses it in, in just a way that means responding to trends, responding to events that happen. It's about the idea of the organization not being a tanker, you know, moving so slowly that they can't take advantage of opportunities as they appear. There's also the notion of failing fast. So trying things out, being able to learn from it quickly, and, and then moving on. So these are the types of terms that we'll be using for our C-suite and the business. But the, I guess the point I'm trying to make is we can use all of the knowledge that we have, but we just translate it and, and will be very compelling to them. Okay, so no do exercise. This is a tool that we use um, specifically when we're talking about data and this will enable us to set a North Star. And we, so we ask this as a workshop of, uh, activity. So what can we know? And then what can we do? 
So let's take an example here. So what would we want to know about our patient population? What actions do we want to take with that information? And who do we want to affect? So if I only knew the difference between a patient who is complying, you know, using a particular treatment and the types of patients who are falling off are not using their, their treatment and, and you know, being non-compliant the way we describe it, then I would be able to design a patient support program that would be tailored to the needs and therefore we could keep more people on treatment. So this is a kind of, you know, walkthrough. And so then that focuses the attention on, okay, so we have to be able to identify is a patient compliant or not? And how can we do that? What data measures, what behavioral data can we do to be able to and allow us to put them in that group and then share information that is tailored to that behavioral profile? We use this tool as well, which is again, something for a workshop. It helps people then prioritize. A lot about our work is about prioritizing. So let's just go through it quickly. So we've got the, the, the axes, difficulty and importance. I think many of us will be using this already, but I think the way this is framed is quite nice. So here we have um, top left quadrant here, most difficult, low important. Pipe dreams, highly ambitious, but difficult. These are the kinds of things that people think, wow, you know, if we could do a moonshot, you know, to, you know, find a new EpiPen that could be, you know, in the watch or something, you know, that kind of thing. Curiosity is interesting, but of questionable value. I think you get the idea there. Incremental improvements, easy wins, you know, those are no brainers. It's barely worth talking about those. We have to do those. But then where you really want is the high value, the need to have from a strategic perspective. They're gonna be perhaps more difficult, but they have the importance as well. So these are just you know, ways to get a group around you and, and put post notes, dots, whatever you might have um, to get people aligned around the vision. What are we doing here? So from market engagement hypothesis to prototype. Now this is an interesting thing by Alberto Savoia. He just released his book, The Right It in 2019. The, the notion of prototype, when I came across it, I thought, well, is this that interesting? It is interesting because we've always had paper prototypes. We've always had a sense of this iterative design of testing things out very early on to mitigate risk and to shape things. And so I thought this is just kind of riffing on that same idea. The idea of a prototype is something that you do before, you know, it's not something that's fully baked as a prototype. And this canvas was developed by, I'm just going to move the name here because it's not Albert himself, it's Chris Callahan. I think this is a very interesting way of stepping through his process to get to hypotheses for a wider prototype. So you start with an idea, then you've got your market engagement hypothesis, and then you drill that down. So you're really, again, trying to get more and more succinct, more and more sharp with your hypothesis. And then you, he's got, you know, I'm, I'm originally American, but hyper-zooming ideas, you know. Sometimes I find Americans use these kind of cool sounding things. You're like, well, what is that, you know? Um, so then the prototyping methods, and I'm going to walk you through a few of them because I think the idea is really exciting, the way he's been able to package them up in a way that's really intuitive. So I'm not going to spend an awful lot of time there on the prototype um, notion, but let's then look at some of his kind of, they're almost like archetypal prototypes, and I think this is quite exciting. So they've got really cool names as well, False Door, Facade, Pinocchio, Mechanical Turk. YouTube. Okay, so, so you got your, your initial idea. And so his, his, the big idea here is about getting it out in the field in some way to test it. So it's a little bit beyond the paper prototype idea of just putting it, you know, in front of users and going, okay, so how might this be? And it's about really giving it a bit more um, attention and a bit more getting it out in the real world for a kind of a real test without having to go invest too much. So the Pinocchio, create a non-operational version of your product and use your imagination to pretend it actually works to see if and how you would use it. That sounds a bit like a paper prototype to me, but one night stand, offer a prototype version of your product or service on a very limited basis to see if there's any interest before making any long-term commitments. This kind of reminds me of, um, I remember reading about people who would use 
AdWords essentially to test concepts to see if there's any interest, you know, that it would be smoke and mirrors, but actually they'd be able to say, well, this idea got more traction than this, you know, even though they were hypothetical. And I think this is kind of along the same lines as that. And I like this. And I think businesses in this space of failing fast really do need more guidance on how to do that and how, how to do it effectively to go beyond that paper prototype into a way that tests it in a, in a more meaningful way, getting a bit of data on it. Now, I just wanna talk a little bit about the machine and designing for the machine, because as I'm, this is a current challenge that we have in, in our team where we are working with, sometimes it's on media, you know, the, the, the algorithms behind Facebook, et cetera, who decide what creator to show to which users is all a bit of a black box. But this is also similar to what we see in the CRM tools with Einstein, et cetera, where as a designer, you push back because there's, you, you don't have any hooks. Like how, how are those decisions going to be made? How do I design stuff that I know is going to work for <laughs> the, the huge pool of people that the, the machine is going to decide who gets what with? And I think it's, it's useful to understand a little bit about how, how it works at a, at a base level. So you have a normal audience, the machine will have the full population there, and then they'll be able to identify a cluster of people. And we've worked with a, a startup who was able to do this for us for identifying HCPs, pharmacists, etc., at scale on programmatic. And I mean, typically the targeting there is very loose. You can't identify people by job titles. It's um, so, you know, it, it's very difficult. You waste a lot of money by targeting with healthcare. You know, you're not going to get your pharmacist. But if this particular um, startup was able to identify at scale big data for all the web traffic for a particular country, there's a cluster of people with a certain number of characteristics that include things that are likely to be pharmacists. And so these people then are going to pharmacy related sites, but they're also doing a whole bunch of other things. And so you can then cluster those and find out that that particular set of pharmacists actually indexes and these numbers here are indices. So that means that this signal, it's, you know, it's fairly strong tennis, you know, that would mean, you know, 38% of a hundred of them are interested in tennis. Financial news, you know, follows tech stars. That's quite a good, good signal. If it was one, everybody would be doing it. Respiratory content, you know, and the difficult thing as a designer is these are disparate and fragmented things. And so we were thinking maybe we should design stuff that has tennis. If, if, if it was relevant to put sports in there, maybe tennis would be the one to do it. But then you think, well, traveling to, you know, you can see where, where I'm going with this. You, you've got a whole bunch of information, but what, what actually is usable? So in the case that we, we've been grappling with, we have to design a personalized creative sequence. We, we have a journey that we have defined that we believe through our research that a, a doctor will go on between the, the sense of initially finding out about a certain technology to purchase. So we've designed a beautiful creative sequence there. And then the media team says, okay, but you know, the AI will just manage all that, you know? And so you think, okay, so is it gonna follow my journey? How's that all gonna work? And, and then you put it in, the machine does its job and you come back and you're looking at things and, you know, certain creatives win. So for example, we would often do a journey based on category first. So you're not gonna buy the, the product if you haven't, you haven't bought into the idea of what it's for and it being useful. So you have to sell them on the sense of why do something differently. And then you talk about the brand advantage. But then in this case, what we found is that the, the creatives that were talking about the brand advantage were the things that, that won. And, and then you scratch your head and you go, that's weird because I would have expected them to need to buy into the idea. But then you look at it and you think, well, actually this is talking about innovation. It's about a new technology that aspect, aspect of the technology that this brand has. And so maybe it's that. And so you, this is where the abductive reasoning comes in. You've got a set of things that don't fit the paradigm that you've defined. <laughs> so you have to you know, spend a lot of time and research building out that lovely journey and coming up with your hypotheses. You have to be able to pivot then and to have a POV on why that creative you know, won. And so then the interesting thing for us is what do you do next? 
So what we found, for example, is that the images of the product were doing better than the images of the um, people. And so you go, okay, we'll do more product. But then in the next round, you then go, okay, then what? Is it like the space of the product real estate? How big is the product? And I think you can see where I'm going with this. If I followed that line of reasoning, I would wind up with an average of an average of an average of an average. But actually, what you, that's not what you wanna do because the, the, the images that you're showing, they are not a representative of all the potential images in the world. And so you need to reserve some of your budget still for the um, exploration and for what's next. And these are the current challenges that we've got. And so you have to be able to try different things. Intuitively, it makes sense, I think. It's just how do you make the decisions of what they will be and what percentage of your creative and how much creative do you need to serve the machine are the things that we're just starting to grapple with. And I think it's a really interesting space. It's, you know, there's tension there because our creative our sense of art, artistry and design designers, us as designers, don't want to think that we're just going to put a whole bunch of things into a bin and the machine's going to tell us which one's the answer. That's not our process. That doesn't jive with who we are. And so, we, but we've got to find a way to get ownership and control and um, and to get to play a role meaningful in this process. I think that's the, what I'm really trying to say. Where it's still. It, it, requires the designer mindset. Okay, so the last thing I want to, we're um, conscious of time here. The last thing I wanted to mention was don't underestimate chemistry. No matter how clever your models, no matter how intriguing your buzzer is, to gain influence, you must appear to be someone who the C-suite thinks is worth telling their needs. And so as I've gone up my career, the types of training that I do now are more around the lines of, you know, voice training or training to on the softer side of skills. Like how do you, consultative selling, like how do you draw the C-suite into what you've got to say in a conversational way rather than talk at them? These kind of things. And these are important. These are possibly more important even than what, what you're showing them. So in summary, treat people well, business, business people like users and use your methods to understand their needs. Ensure you align on the vision upfront before you divine, dive into research. So that's that visioning piece. Ensure you've got everyone at the same table. Combine declarative insights with behavioral insights that will define what you will measure over time. So avoid the persona in the drawer syndrome. Instead of complex deliverables, use strategic narrative and simple tools that are supported with key data points. And combine the ideas of prototyping, piloting, and evaluation into hypotheses. They love the, the notion of hypotheses and talk about hypotheses and design experiments. Test in the wild, this is the prototype notion, and be ready to pivot and flex your abductive powers. And remember, our job is to find the simple in the complex. Simplicity is complexity resolved. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Angel. That was awesome. No, I'd love, I love how you mentioned kind of, you know, the power of storytelling and creating a narrative there. I think that was really powerful. Um, yeah, if anyone has any questions, please do submit them uh, using the Q&A box. I can see a couple in there already. Um, uh, Angel, you showed and kind of spoke about a lot of kind of tools and techniques there, kind of which would you say is kind of the most valuable? Like if you if you could only choose yeah. one. Yeah, I mean, the thing that I find that my team struggle with the most is that strategic narrative. And I find, you know, people drown in the insights a lot of times, you know, and the, the part, I guess, that I find myself needing to do the most oversight for or to help people with mostly is in so what, you know, it's that really sharp story. So if they take a look at the tools that I've provided here, the strategic narrative tools and think about that, that storytelling from a dramatic perspective and like the emotion, like why the hell should they care about what I have to say? Then I think, you know, those are the basics that you need to come up with a story and just making sure that, you know, you, you draw three boxes and go, okay, so what am I gonna say first? What am I gonna say second? And what am I gonna say third? I think that is the, if there's one takeaway from this talk, that that would be the thing that would make the most difference. Thank you. Um, so we have a question from 
Bob here. Um, Bob asks, um, is abductive reasoning transferable from one discipline to another, i.e. commerce to UX? Absolutely. You know, I, I described the case of the doctor and the crime scene detective there. So, you know, I think I, I wouldn't suggest that you go in and saying I'm an abductive reasoning specialist here. It's not not really about that. It's about putting together the disparate pieces of information of, and, the, and the findings to create an insight driven point of view. That's what it's about. So if you're, it's commerce equally valuable, like what does all this stuff mean, you know, and coming up with a POV and putting that on the table. That is, I believe, where we as UX people, designers, absolutely outshine everybody else because it's what we do every day, you know? Thank you. Um, so we've got a question here, um, just asking um, if you have any resources or advice for people who are wanting to kind of learn more about this. Um, there's a number of links in this document, so I think you'll be, um, Henry, correct me if I'm wrong, this will be available to people? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. so I've pointed you through um, a number of things there. I, mean, I think Albert Savoy's book is interesting, you know, building the right, I, um, building, <laughs> right, it, <laughs> um, yeah, and, and just, you know, most of the stuff I've got here are, is, are not about the full story, it's all about the tools that come together to help you do this. So um, I think actually that would probably be more valuable, but don't be afraid to contact me on LinkedIn for further follow-up. I'm very happy to connect. Thanks, Angel. Um, so the next question here, um, they say, wonderful talk, thank you. Um, this really sparked an interest. Have you had any experience using strategy story narr um, narratives working with startups at investment stage? Um, perhaps for pitch decks, I wondered if you had any perspectives on where to start. Um, I have worked many times in on drug development before it's approved. And so it's kind of that that um, type of mindset where a lot of investment has gone in already, but you're not really sure if it's going to fly. And, and a lot of it is still in the stages where it, you need very strong um, stories about how that, that this is an important thing to invest in, you know? And so um, the second part of the question was, have I got experience in this? And uh, yes. yes, it says, do you have any experience using strategy story narratives working with startups at investment stage? Yeah, yeah, that's the ex yeah, experience. And these tools are absolutely what, um, what you need it's got to be compelling, you know, so go for that drama, go for the scale. Remember the strategic narrative, that last box. So what is the opportunity there? And I would flesh that out in detail and frame it around growth and frame it around always connected to purpose as well. Just like making money isn't enough. It's got to be, you know, we're going to save lives, improve patient outcomes, you know, do something valuable in the world that make people care. Thank you. Um, so we have um, a question here from Manny who asks, what are your deliverables when presenting strategy? Unfortunately, most of the time it's workshops, uh, workshops I don't mind, but decks. My life has become largely um, PowerPoint. <laughs> I never saw that coming. <laughs> but the workshops do give me a break. And so I love tools like Miro and Mural, use them all the time. Thank you. Um, um, so we have another question here. Um, uh, they say, thank you so much for your talk. Um, how can we start being more business thinkers, uh, in inverted commas, at work? Um, do you think we should read business finance reports, kind of financial newspapers, et cetera? You yeah, you know, that's a really interesting one. Whenever I start working on something new, I look at the analyst reports and there's something in my world called Fierce Pharma. And so it, really it's like bloggy news bits about you know certain pharma companies and but it always brings in the you know the drama around you know oh this new drug will see off you know somebody's blockbuster so it's always in you know really hyperbole kind of terms but i find very useful so if you can identify for your vertical or your domain a, an analyst kind of news source, I find that that's my go-to place to like just get a read on 
whether this new product is going to is seen to be by the powers that be and this is coming from the investment world which is kind of at the leading edge of all this whether anybody thinks this is going to um, disrupt anything you know because you need to know what the potential for this pr new product is and that those analyst things will give you that thank you um so yeah we've got time just for one more question um Last, did you encounter challenges when it comes to being um uh did you encounter challenges when it comes to being um a woman of so there's if someone could rephrase that as, <laughs> I, I can't quite uh get the context on that um so if you want to kind of rephrase that that'd be great um uh, there's another question uh from manny here he's just asking about kind of um kind of the hiring process for kind of strategic designers is mm. that anything kind of you look for in a strategic designer um yes and when i hire and i've been hiring a lot so um do get in touch with me but <laughs> i have freelance work often and permanent but if, if you're you have to be in the uk for permanent which is kind of a pain but um what do i look for i look for you know it sounds it sounds kind of counterintuitive, but like I was saying, the soft skills are really important for strategists. So I was just interviewing a guy last week and I just thought, you know, this guy speaks in such a, he, you know, he doesn't sound arrogant. He sounds human. He sounds compelling. He doesn't sound, you know, like a, the priest, although I, I still believe some people play that role very well. This person is warm. People are going to want to tell them their needs, you know, and have build a relationship with him. And I thought, OK, I'm going to hire this person. His thinking sounded sharp on, you know, the PowerPoint decks. He, he walked me through. He said the right words. And, and I almost feel like I'm not sure how he's going to do when he gets in, whether he'll be able to do the job and get the work done. But that's a lot of the battle, you know, for a strategist. And I would say design strategy would be the same. It's the soft skills. I'm really looking for that. Thank you very much. Um, so I can see in the chat, um, as a couple of people asking whether resources full talks to be, uh, will be kept. Will uh, everyone that's signed up for any any session at Interact Global, we will send them, um, we will send you all the talk recordings. Um, uh, by the end of today, I believe. Um, so just bear with us on that. And yeah, you'll have all the videos in your inbox soon. Um, Angel, thank you so much. Uh, and also thank you to everyone that tuned in. Um, and as mentioned earlier this week, we are hiring here at Nomensa, um, kind of looking for both permanent freelance professionals of all levels across pretty much all areas of the business, UX design, accessibility development, client services, project management, and Kind of everything in between um check out nomensa.com forward slash careers or drop us an email at hello at nomensa.com for more information on that um up next we have a leadership panel um at 1 p.m uk time um still time to sign up for that so uh so if you haven't done already we will see you then um and yeah thank you um angel thank you very much and yeah thanks to everyone that um that's tuned in <laughs>